This lecture is going to be about the Near East, so the areas we're going to be covering are the Levant, which is kind of like modern-day Israel, and this particular little coastal area here. We're going to talk a little bit about Anatolia, and then of course Mesopotamia over here. And then this whole area all the way through here is referred to as the Fertile Crescent. So the first thing we want to talk about is the Epipaleolithic period, which is around 14 to 11.6 thousand um, years ago, or bef years before present. And there's a culture that has been identified for the Levant area called the Natufian. And we find this in modern-day Israel, Syria, Lebanon, and Turkey. It was first identified by Dorothy Garad in 1928 at a site called Wadi and Natuf, and that's actually a cave site in northern Israel. What we find during this time period is an era of incipient cultivation. So we're starting to see some of the technology for the manipulation of plants developed. And one of the earliest villages of the Natufians is Ein Malaha, which is also in Israel, and from this site we've been able to learn quite a bit about the Natufian culture. So we know that there were villages, somewhere between 150 to 250 people, so we have some variety in size there. They're generally located near nut forests, so like oaks, pines, pistachios, and also near good water supply. So there were a variety of environments to exploit. Now the houses were circular, semi-subterranean, and we generally find stone foundation. So you can see a reconstruction of a Natufian house here, and then you can see this kind of semicircular plan drawing from an archaeological site of what a Natufian structure might have looked like. So you can see some of the stones here. Here's what it would have looked like in profile, and again, semi-subterranean. So we often find storage pits inside the houses, so you can kind of see those here. Um, we often find them also out in the central areas, so they're kind of between houses. Uh, we find stone line hearths or fire pits. Um, Kent Flannery suggests using ethnographic data as a, or ethnoarchaeological data as a, a model that some of the huts were for storage, kitchen, and some were for stables, so there's a variety of things going on, and then any of the central pits were for community storage. Now, subsistence activities here, what we see is an intensification of the collection of cereal grains, so wheat and barley. Um, at Natufian sites we find a relatively large number of mortars and pestles, and these are often found set into the ground, so people were using these all the time, not moving them around very much. We do know that they were still hunting, so primarily gazelle, and it looks like they were actually driving the gazelle into enclosures and trapping them that way. We also see pig, deer, wild goat, wild horse, wild cattle, and we also see waterfowl. So you can see in this map here, it's a schematic of the environmental s setting. So you've got the aquatic gazelle zone, and then in the uplands where your cereals are going to be at, the nuts, the deer, and so forth. And of course, gathering, because nuts were a big part of their diet, and again, that's where we find most of the villages. So we have this kind of base of gazelles, nuts, and cereals. So this is going to what set us up for particularly the changing relationship with plants. Burials are interesting. They're found at a lot of different sites. And at the site of Ain Malaha, we have two kinds. We have individuals who are buried beneath house floors under stone slabs. And then we also have group burials where we find individuals in pits. Most of the burials don't have grave goods. There are a very few that do have some exotic goods, like shells from the Mediterranean and greenstone beads from like Syria and Jordan. So there is a little bit of what we might call incipient status differentiation, but it's not anything that's really noticeable or severe, I guess maybe is another way to talk about it. From the burial population that we do have, we know that there's an increase in dental caries. So that actually means there's more cavities in the burial population. And this is probably due to the increasingly high starch diet from the cereals that they've 
they're putting into their diet more and more often. It's interesting about the burial population also is that 57 to 75 percent of the individuals that have been found are male. Now the normal variability or what we might expect to see in a similar culture is between 40 and 68 percent. So the question then is why are we seeing this difference? It could just be that females are buried differently and they were in areas that didn't have good preservation conditions. This could be an indication that males have higher status within the community could also mean that there was conflict in the between the Tufian communities and that more men were killed and it could be that there's female infanticide so we generally don't find infant burials because the bones are pretty soft and they don't preserve well so it could be any one of these it could be a combination we're just not really sure at this particular time the other thing we see is third molar agenesis, and this means that people are born with no wisdom teeth. So we actually find this in 47% of the burial population. So this is actually something that's too high to have occurred naturally. So it probably occurred through the process of endogamy. And endogamy is a marriage pattern where you have to marry within a specific group. Um, a lot of people often refer to this as inbreeding. But it doesn't necessarily have to be within relatives, it just has to be Maybe you've got a village with several different families and you have to marry within that village. That's also endogamy. But because the gene pool is rather small, traits can get fixed in the population rather easily. And since it doesn't really hurt us to not have a third molar, it's not something that would be detrimental and would be able to um, go through the population relatively easily. But this is kind of interesting because this is an example of how we can use archaeological evidence to address social concerns like marriage patterns. Some of the other traits of the Natufian, we see the first appearance of decorated non-utilitarian artifacts. So here we're talking about carved limestone figurines. And we actually see these over the entire Natufian area. So that's an indication to archaeologists that there's a shared ideological or religious theme going on here. Uh, we see stone vessels. There's no clay or pottery working at this time. There's fishing gear, bone tools, such as awls and harpoons and fishnets. And we also have indications of trade in the form of obsidian and shells. Now, the end of the Epipaleolithic and the end of the Natufian, we do see some climate change. And the Levant becomes much drier. We see changes in the subsistence strategy because wild cereals become harder to find. Some people return to a hunting and gathering lifestyle, and some return to agriculture. And this is where we're going to go from now on and talk about those cultures that have become based primarily on an agricultural lifeway. So the first one we're going to talk about is the aceramic, and this brings us into the Neolithic or the New Stone period. And the Neolithic can be divided up into several different um, eras, I guess, might be to talk about it. But we're going to talk about the aceramic Neolithic first from 11.6 to 8.9 thousand years before present. This is pre-pottery. And we see increased use of domesticated plants and animals. We also see a continuation of this kind of standardized form throughout the area. In this case, it's in the form of arrowheads. So we see these Kim arrowheads all over the, the, the Levant area. We see stone mace heads, so it's a new kind of weapon. Um, weapons could be just for display, could be for competition, could be for warfare. Mace could also be an indication of some type of social differentiation coming into play. We also see some different art. We see small 3D figurines in both clay and stone. <coughs> Excuse me, and they're primarily of women and bulls. So some people have taken this as an indication that we're seeing the male and female divine. So this could be an indication of new ideas about the cosmos and the supernatural.